when I heard this theme, real utopias from dreams to practice, I was pretty unsure if I had a message for TEDx Denison. And that's because, as Adam said, I'm really a scientist and my career has really been based out of Granville the entire time. But when I speak to teams, a lot of time I use this quote, backward, understood, be only, can, but, forward, lived, be, must, life. It's one of my favorite things to reflect on. And if you read it that way, you're kind of confused. But if we turn it around and read it the other way, life must be lived forward, but can only be understood backwards, makes a lot of sense. So as I reflected, on what I do, and my practice is really about helping all sorts of teams really embody their dreams. When I reflect on that, it became very clear to me that my view is that utopia is not an end state, it's a quest. And it's a quest shared by, by teams that are very passionate and purposeful, trying to solve something that's never been solved before in the world. So I would like to share some examples. I've picked out some from I've picked out one from corporate America, from a very small company, from, I guess I'm going to say, a government project that turned into a nonprofit, and then a local project. And I want to tell you about the things I think that can help you potentially have a higher probability that you can experience this utopia that I view as a quest. So let's get started. The first example that I'm going to speak to you about comes from corporate America, and it talks about themes that we're worried about today. It talks about waste minimization, pollution minimization, and the third area is about workforce productivity. So let's have a look. With Truemouth, there is no cleanup after the job. You put it in the cattle, you're done with it. It's melted, goes on the roof, that's what you want. So what was that about? Well, it is about a real product that was developed 20 years ago. Several years of effort, several patents later, a product is there. But the teams who were part of it, we still get very excited when we're together and think about the quest we were on. And the elements I'll point out in this quest are, first of all, there was a critical need being solved. And the teams that worked on it had personal and team passion out the wazoo. Solution was not known. There was a creative endeavor. And they succeeded. I'd like to shift gears now away from asphalt, which is incredibly interesting, in case you were wondering, Two, medical devices. Not that long ago, I had a team that was composed of a cardiologist, a engineer focused on MR systems, magnetic resonance imaging, a agricultural engineer, and a graduate student come and talk to me about a venture they wanted to start. The unmet need, they felt, was that in diagnostics of cardiovascular disease, when you stress test someone in one room and then you trotted them in and laid them into an MRI, there was too much time between the stress testing and the actual imaging. So what they wanted to do was develop a treadmill and put it right next to the MRI and be able to test people in almost real time. So what's the problem, the unmet need? Well, treadmills have ferrous components in them. And what that means is if they're in a presence of a big, giant magnet like an MRI, they will actually get sucked across the room and smush up against that magnet, and it just won't work. So this team decided to develop a treadmill that had no ferrous components in it and was powered by pneumatics. And today, several years later, several patents later, it is now in clinical trials in four centers, medical centers, and the efficacy data is starting to come out showing that they can develop better medical outcomes by this testing in close proximity. So two examples from corporate America. I would like to shift you now and show you an international example. And to me, this is a profound example. This is an example that came from the government of Ethiopia. And in this example, 
I got a call from the governor's office and asked if I could please speak with a team from Ethiopia. And I said I'd be happy to do that. And I met with the deputy prime minister of Ethiopia and some of his colleagues in Columbus, Ohio, and they asked if we could mount an effort to look at how they could sustain advantage with some of their products in Ethiopia. The image behind me is a coffee sorting facility in Ethiopia. This is one of the projects we worked on, and we worked on several others, such as floriculture and, and, and other things. But the story isn't so much about this. The story is about the quest that my community here in Granville engaged me in. And when they heard I was working on this, a lot of people said, how can we help? One of the churches in Granville especially kept asking me how, and I said, well, let's start collecting pens and pencils. And oh, by the way, if you have any discretionary money that I could take and give away in Ethiopia, I would love a chance to do that. So pens and pencils started coming in. And I filled up my luggage, and those pens and pencils were very easy to get rid of in Ethiopia. They flew out of my hands, and there were a lot of happy folks to get their hands on those. But that $1,000, really, I was very cautious and careful about how I would disperse that. And I met some people who were not from the capital city, which is where most of the aid goes in Ethiopia. And those people talked to me about needs in education. And I ended up handing them the $1,000, and they took it eight hours away from Addis Ababa into the sesame seed growing region of the country. And there, they took that money, and they put a phone system in the school, and they began to help women, young girls, who were, who were wanting to stay in school with educational materials and the like. But that's not the story. The story is what happened next. The community in central Ohio saw what was happening, that our team out here in Granville were helping, and what it did in Ethiopia, and they formed a nonprofit. That nonprofit went on to raise money, in involve others from the world, and get donations to the tune of roughly $300,000. Today, there's a school in Ethiopia. It services 600 kids. The first floor is built. There are 20 teachers with salaries, and education is booming. And that happened from a network experience and just conversations with people. So as I move forward now, I want to bring the story home, home to Licking County. And I want to speak about Howard Lefevre. Lefevre. Howard, when he died at the age of 101, was viewed by the Columbus Dispatch as a notable force. And he left a legacy of ideas, love for education, and philanthropy, which many of us in this room are still involved with. So Howard, the story for Howard is an incredible story of a person working out of field. Howard was a uh, school, in, in school, he was an a architectural engineer. And when he got out of school, he couldn't find a job in field. It's a story we healed here today. So Howard accepted a job with the AMPT company, and he loaded trucks. And he was really good at it. And over time, he became their foreman. And over time, he purchased a trucking facility, a trucking company. That company, he moved to his adopted hometown, which would be Newark, Ohio. And he started to service clients. The clients included a fledgling company called Owens Corning Fiberglass, who, who decided to site their main facility in Newark, Ohio. Well, Howard's company, b &L Freight, grew with his clients. And today, the company is called Truck One, and it's servicing the 48, continental, 48 states in the continental US. But that's where it starts. It's what he did out of field that is important. He founded and he helped co-found OSU Newark, Central Ohio Technical College, and The Works. The Works is in Newark, Ohio. And I'd kind of like to focus there. For Howard, it started as an architectural restoration project. But it became a passion for him and is a passion for many of us. The quest that he has put us on here is to change the culture and the opportunities for our youth in our community. Last weekend, I was there. So were several people from Denison. And we had a STEM fest. 
science kind of projects, and we had 1,000 people over the weekend. Aha, aha moments abound. Um, I was pretty staggered. One of the toothpick bridges held 300 pounds when we stopped testing it. And kids were talking about bio-based fuels and all sorts of things. Every day at the works, we are opening thoughts about careers and thoughts about what students can be. And never before in this community did they have those kind of visions, mentors, et cetera, put in front of them. So when we look at all these examples, there's a couple key things that I think if you focus on will help improve the probability that you can join one of these utopian quests. First of all, network. Everything happens through people. It's not through machines. Focus on solving an absolute critical need. In, in, surround yourself with a team that has purpose and personal passion in each member. And that team should be quite diverse. It's only with diverse thinking and inclusiveness of that diverse thinking do teams become incredibly successful. Over your life, you need to have a willingness to learn. I've worked in asphalt, I've worked in medical devices, and I'm learning about dogs right now. Be able to work with limited resources, because in that situation, that's where creativity happens, when you don't have everything you need. And be comfortable with uncertainty. You never know where this path will lead. Well, I just want to say, in closing, Thank you to TEDx for allowing me to kind of understand backwards. And I also want to say that we have challenges and needs everywhere. And I'm going to ask you, Denison and Denison TEDx and our wider community, why not get after some of these needs right now? Why not us? Why not now? Why not here? I am real ready to join your teams and to bring my network to your teams as well. Thank you.